We're talking about donuts. Um, not these kind of donuts, obviously, but um, donut shaped planets. That's what we're going to talk about. Can we imagine that you could have a planet that was shaped literally like this, like a ring? You know, physically, it is possible. You know, the laws of physics permit you to have a, a donut shape like this. So what, what do you need to have such a configuration? Basically, you need the, the object to be spinning. Okay, so it needs to be spinning. Why? If it's not spinning, then it's just going to collapse under, under its own gravity. So you need that, that centrifugal force to push outwards. If you spin it too much, basically all the material will just uh, sort of be shot out into space. But if you get it just right, in principle, you could get a, a planet shaped like this. It's a very difficult configuration to sort of engineer. Whether, whether it's gonna happen naturally is another matter, but maybe some sort of Elon Musk type uh, alien innovator could, uh, you know, sort of for whatever reason, a, a big stunt create one. But within the laws of physics, it is allowed to have such a configuration. You just need that centrifugal force to push you out. You could even start with a, like an ellipsoid type, type um, planet and spin it in the right way and get the, the, the donut to form. Again, it would be something you'd, you'd have to do very precisely. It wouldn't just happen. You, know, you knock it at all and it's going to destroy it. But if you get it right, you can get, get something like this to form. And it would actually be roughly stable in the sense that, you know, you spin it up a little bit more, it's not going to destroy it. Spin it down a little bit, it's not going to destroy it. Where it is vulnerable is to things like tidal forces. So this is, you know, much more stretched out than an ordinary planet. You know, if you think of it's orbiting some star, then the difference between sort of the force here and the force here could cause it to break up. So this is the kind of instability that, that it would be vulnerable to. That actually affects where you might want to put one of these things. You don't want it to be, put it too close to the star because it, it will break up for, for that reason, because of the tidal forces. But of course, if you want to live on this thing, you've got to be near enough to the star to sort of get all the heat and stuff. So actually, if such a thing were to exist, you'd probably want it in the vicinity of a bright star. Uh, that way you could be far away, but you know, sort of getting enough energy from, from the star to, to sort of support life on it. So it's interesting to think about what some of the you know, features would be, would be like on, on this, this, this crazy object. A lot of it depends on the tilt. So for example, if it, if it had zero tilt relative to the plane of its orbit, the really interesting stuff would happen on this interior ring. You'd basically get no light on the interior at all, ever. And so it would be you know, a really cold, dark, desolate place. The water would be frozen, carbon dioxide would be frozen. It would be quite a horrendous place. Whereas out here, it would be perfectly nice. Of course, there'd be different, you know, temperature differences, which could lead to some extreme weather. But, but overall, it, it, you know, over here, it'd be quite nice. Over here, it'd be not very nice. The other feature about it is, is, is to think about is the, um, you know, where the, what the gravitational distribution is. You would always sort of fall inwards, you know, into the object. The gravity would always point into the object. There's no lateral flow. That basically makes sense because it's a surface of, of equal potential. It has to be. But where is the gravity least? Where is it strongest? So if you imagine an object which was, say, the mass of the Earth and was spun up to the right rate, what you would find is, is that this, this region would be a bit flatter than, than in this case. The gravity would be weakest here and in the interior. It would be quite weak here, maybe, maybe a third of, of Earth's gravity. And the reason for that is, is just because, like, in here, you've got the pull of the other side pulling you in the wrong direction. Um, here you've got the sort of large centrifugal effects. So actually the gravity would be strongest here, still less than Earth's gravity, but the weakest gravitational regions would, would be here and here. Tony, I thought the center of gravity would be in the middle there. And if you were living in here, you'd be sucked into the middle. So certainly if you, if you were far away, then you, that's what you'd experience, right? But if you're within the object, you sort of feel the distribution a bit more. And, and indeed, the dominant effect of you around here would be this mass here, okay? You, that's not to say you don't feel this region, you do. Uh, and that's why, for example, the gravity is weak here. But, uh, but, but yeah, the dominant effect clearly comes to here, and that's how it holds together. It has to be like that, otherwise it wouldn't even hold together. People living on the inside of the ring aren't being sucked up into space. No, the main force would be that way, but they would have competing effects pulling them that way, which is why the gravity feels weak. What if it was tilted like the Earth, like 23 degree tilt? You would now get some light in the interior, okay? There would be some light in the interior, particularly on the equator. What you would find is that in the summer and the winter, you would have ordinary days. They'd be very short, because this thing's rotating very quickly, it'd probably rotate within a few hours. Okay, so you'd have very short days, but, but nevertheless, you would get days and nights because you would get that, that cycle of light. If you were slightly in some sort of, you know, region further north or further south, then you would be a bit like the sort of polar regions here. You'd get like a period of, of six months without sun, you know, and it would be like that basically, very similar to the, to the polar regions. Because of that difference 
in how much energy these areas received, again, you would have quite sharp temperature differences, maybe some extreme weather um, associated with that. There's also some quite interesting plate tectonics could occur as well. So you might ask, well, would you even have plate tectonics? And naively you might say not, right? Because you know, this, this has a very large surface area compared to like a spherical planet, for example, you know, compared to its volume. So you might think it's going to lose a lot of its thermal energy and therefore you wouldn't have the volcanism inside the, the uh, you know, inside this object. But again, you've got the tidal forces, which, which it feels more of. So that might, that might liven things up a little bit. So there's possibility you could have, could have some uh, plate tectonics. And then you get some really weird stuff going on. And again, the exciting place is this interior. This is where all the fun and games happens. One thing you'll notice is if you take a region here, so imagine a plate, like a tectonic plate, has a certain size here and it fits quite nicely into that ring there, into that area. But the ring on the outside is much bigger than the ring on the inside. So if you try to push this plate inwards, it's not got enough space. What's going to happen? Folding. You're going to get crazy mountain ranges in here, right? And you'll also get rifts as they move away, as, as, as plates try to move out of that region. <laughs> it's not big enough to fill the space they go into, so you get rifts, so you get mountains, you get rifts, you have great geological structures in here. The grandest of Grand Canyons. Yeah, and the other thing to remember, of course, is, is the gravity is weaker as well, right? So the mountains are going to be higher. So not only are you going to get mountains because things get you know, squashing into here, but they're going to be higher as well, maybe three times higher if it's, if it's a third of the gravity. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of crazy effects that you would get here. You'd get like very high waves. Why would you get high waves? Well, of course, once again, because of the weaker gravity, so, so you'll get larger waves, perhaps three times higher. You get high clouds for the same reason. So quite an exotic region in, inside that interior, I think, compared to maybe the rest of the planet. Uh, so it's quite fun. Tony, we live in this almost infinite universe that you've talked about with us before. Do you think one of these has formed somewhere? See, obviously it's a great question. Um, one like this with a, with a great hole in the middle. Well, I mean, is the universe infinite? It might even be donut shaped, of course. Uh, is, is it infinite? Um, if it's infinite, then you might enter the, might be a possibility. I think, like I said before, it's probably something that you would have to artificially create with some te fancy technology. But what is interesting and what could exist and probably does, does exist, and our Earth may have even been shaped like this in the past, it's not quite a donut like this, but a donut with the jam in the middle. This is, I, was, I was describing it to my kids and that's what they said. They said, oh, it's like a donut with the jam in the middle. So what I mean by that is, is you've got this sort of donut structure on the outside, but there's, there's an interior region as well. So the overall shape is still a bit donut-like, but it's like an interior region, which is, which is there as well, like the jam, is essentially, which is connected. It's actually got a name. It's called a synestia. It's only something that's apparently so, so far has appeared in simulations, in particular by, I think it's Simon Locke and Sarah Stewart, who are two uh, physicists working in America. What they showed was they were doing some simulations of uh, the early solar system, for example, and they showed that when two objects, you know, two, two sort of planet-sized objects collide, then there's a possibility of forming one of these, these synestias. So you have your, your two planet-sized objects, they come in together, it's, it's extremely, it generate a lot of heat. So they can essentially vaporize all the rock. And at the same time, they can come in with a lot of angular momentum. And that angular momentum is gonna combine and it's gonna cause them to spin faster. It's just like bringing two skaters together, right? You've got two skaters, they're spinning. If they come together, then they're gonna combine their angular momentum. And if they tuck in, they'll spin faster and faster and faster. So you have this situation where two planets come in, smash in together, heat everything up, vaporize everything, and are spinning like crazy. Okay, what happens? So in that configuration, which is quite a possible configuration, you find that you get this, this rapidly spinning region in the interior, okay? And you might say, and it's, it's spinning like crazy, and you say, well, well, let's look at the gas on the, on the outer edge. How fast is that spinning? It's spinning very quickly. In fact, it's spinning too quickly in principle. So what you'd say is, is it spinning faster than, say, a satellite that would be at the same point? So, you know, if you take a satellite in orbit around a planet, you can say, you can work out how fast it's spinning, how fast it's, it's, it's going, how fast it's going around. Orbiting. Yeah, how fast it's orbiting. Yeah, you can, work out how, you can work out its speed at a particular speed based on its altitude. OK, and if you bring that, that satellite in towards the edge of the edge of the planet, it'll have a particular speed that's characteristic of, of, of how high it is. If you compare that speed to the speed of the edge bit of gas, 
If the edge bit of gas is going faster, that's a completely inconsistent configuration. You can't should, have that. It should shoot off. It needs to spread out. It's absolutely exactly right, Brady. It needs to spread out. And that's what happens. This is how the synestia forms. The object that you create in the impact is trying to spin too quickly. Okay, so it needs to spread out its outer gas and it can do it because it's all gaseous. So it spreads itself out and it forms this donut shape. So what you have is this inner rotating core spinning like mad and you have this gas, large gas, gaseous, you know, vaporized object spread out. Okay, so it looks like a donut. As I said, it's called a synestia. Uh, syn means sort of, to, you know, together. The, the, the estia part comes from the Greek goddess Hestia, uh, which is the goddess of structure. So it's like this sort of together structure, but the inner core connected to the to this outer donut like like object uh, and there's, there's good reason to believe that this our earth might have had a period of synestia phase maybe for a few hundred years very early on oh that short a time yeah it's very quick yeah it doesn't so yeah, yeah so, so, so it doesn't last very long and the reason is because the object cools so as it cools it starts to shrink okay so 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 yeah so it's, it's a temporary phase now you could, in principle, have such an object near a very hot star. It remains vaporized, it's spinning, then it could be a, a synestia. So we could look for synestias very close to stars. But there's good reason to believe the Earth did spend some time um, as a synestia, and the reason is it can explain some quirky features of how the Moon was formed. One of the puzzles about the Moon is, uh, is, is its content. So we know that it has a lot of its makeup is very similar to, to what we see on Earth, which suggests they have a common origin. Okay, and the usual theory is that, you know, a Mars-sized planet, I think it's called Thea, comes crashing into Earth and then the moon sort of spilled, it came, came from that. But one of the slightly subtle things about this is, is that there are elements on Earth which are sort of less abundant on, on the moon. Okay, some of the more volatile stuff, stuff like potassium and, and sodium, it's, not, it's just not as common on the moon. So why? A bit of a mystery. Synestias can explain it. And the way they explain it is, so you have this collision, synestia forms in the, in the very early Earth, right? This is great. And then, and then inside the synestia, there's a little bit of the molten rock, which kind of forms the seed for, the, for a proto-moon. Okay, and it sort of gathers around it, and then the synestia starts to cool. Now, everything's vaporized at this point. So the more volatile stuff's vaporized and the less volatile stuff is, is vaporized. As the synestia cools, the less volatile stuff, stuff like silicon, starts to sort of essentially rain down on the objects. So it rains down on the proto moon, it rains down on the central core, but it's raining silicon on this moon, building the moon up. But it's, it's putting the less volatile stuff on there, right? the silicons and, and the you know, aluminiums and things like that. Then it cools, cools some more, the synestia falls in, takes with it all the more volatile stuff that isn't ready to rain down on the proto-moon yet, leaves the moon behind without any of that volatile stuff, and everything else cools over time and falls back into the earth, and, and that explains the, the difference. So this is one of the ideas for how the moon was formed uh, from basically donuts in the, in the early solar systems. So the earth, earth was a donut, maybe. <laughs> Can I tell you about a new number? So it's a very scary number, it's a bit evil. It's um, Belfigur's prime. Okay, so Belfigur, one of the seven princes of hell. So a black hole will eventually radiate, it'll eventually give off a type of radiation called Hawking radiation, right? Now this is what you get when you apply quantum mechanics to the event horizon of a black hole. 